Anyways, welcome back to our continuing Bible study series on the life lessons that we can learn from the life of Abraham. <coughs> Excuse me. So last Sunday morning, we studied Genesis chapter 21, and from the, the life of Abraham, we learned four biblical principles, how to defeat despair in our life. Now, friends, Abraham had learned how to defeat despair um, through adversity. And if we desire to defeat despair in our life like Abraham, we must remember that God can do everything. First and foremost, always remember that God can do anything he wants. Secondly, we must refocus on obedience to God. You know, um, it's kind of funny when you know we're, we know that we're supposed to be obedient to, say, the traffic laws. No one cares about them. Um, we're supposed to be obedient to, you know, the civil laws, the criminal laws, and all this stuff. But when it comes time to, to be obedient towards God, sometimes we stumble and struggle with that one. And I don't know why, um, but um, we need to remember that God can do anything. Refocus on obedience to God. We must rely on God's direction. Again, we always like to do it our way. We don't want to follow God's way. Um, but finally, we must rest in God's protection. And that, that's, the I'd say, the most special of all for me as you're fighting any storm in life, knowing that you can rest in God's protection should be one of the sweetest promises of all. We're already saved, so we're protected from the worst that could happen to us. Um, but <clears throat> God will protect us from worldly dangers and harm as well. We just have to trust in him and run to him, and his name is a strong tower. Who can, who can defeat God? Give me a, a clue, because I can't think of anyone. So we should be able to rest in God's protection. And when we do those four, we can defeat despair in our life like Abraham. Now this Sunday morning, we are continuing our continuing Bible study series on the life lessons that we can learn from the life of Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, we're going to be in verses 1 through 24, which, of course, is the entirety of the chapter. Now, sometimes life just does not always seem to make much sense. Following the incredible despair and stress he faced when God instructed him to send Ishmael away, Abraham had several years of peace and tranquility. His relationship with God apparently grew stronger, as did his love and affection for his son Isaac. Now, Abraham, during this time, he got to know the Lord as the everlasting God, the God who is eternally the same yesterday, today, and forever. Abraham learned that he could trust God to fulfill whatever he promised. Now, God was about to ask Abraham to do something that would require supernatural faith, because for us, um, this just didn't make sense. And for him, I'm sure it could not have made any sense what God was about to ask him to do. And I say supernatural, you know, faith by itself is already supernatural. If you can trust in God, you're above nature already. Um, regular nature does trust in God. They, it knows nothing else. But human nature wants to trust in others or themselves rather than God. So Abraham is going to have to dig deep into his heart and put a level of trust towards God that we can't even imagine. So from this chapter in Abraham's life, we will learn three biblical things that we must do whenever life does not seem to make much sense. The first thing we must do when life does not seem to make much sense, is to go wherever God guides. Go wherever God guides. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 8. God's holy word declares, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and Abraham said, Behold, here I am. And God said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. <clears throat> and Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and 
Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And Abraham took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And Abraham said, Here am I. And Isaac said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Now that God had had previously instructed Abraham to send Ishmael away, the stage was now set for the supreme test of Abraham's faith. We must keep this passage in context. It says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. We must understand that this is a test of Abraham's faith. It reminds us that a growing faith requires constant testing. Nothing will grow without being tested in some way. You You think that you're smart, okay, you have to prove it. How do you prove it? Through testing. You have to take some type of test, whether it's, you know, a goofy, uh, um, what do you call it, IQ test, which IQ is supposed to be intelligence quota, but it's really the modern IQ test is more of a knowledge quota, not intelligence. The two are not the same, and I don't have time to go into all that, but intelligence and knowledge are not the same thing. There are people who know all kinds of things um, but don't know what to do with it. They are not intelligent. They just have good memory. That's all. Um, If you don't know how to apply knowledge, you have no intelligence, period. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, (coughs) when God tests our faith, it grows stronger. God was now going to test Abraham's faith to the limit. God's holy word declares in James chapter 1 and verse 3 that the trying of your faith worketh patience. I told you it was in there somewhere, and there it is. Um, The trying of your faith worketh patience. And then God's holy word declares in the very next verse, but let patience have her perfect worth, work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. There's something good to be said about the testing of our faith. We know this incident is a test, by the way, but understand that at the time, Abraham had no such knowledge. God told Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, it's important to note, when, um, as a kid, whenever I was told this story, and even as a, a young adult, whenever I, I was told this story, or taught this story in Sunday school, or, or services, whatever, they always emphasize that this um, guy by the name of Isaac is probably just a little boy. But that's not one, it's not documented that way, but it's probably not accurate either. You know, and part of it is guessing, but some people put him as old as 32, by the way. And But the a- average age that people select is usually around 16 to 18. So this is not a little boy. This is a young man. So just keep that in mind, because that's important to keep in mind. So that means his dad is at least 115, 16 years old. Um, this is not a, a young spring chicken. He's, uh, he's an old fart, like uh, about half the age of Brother Priest back there. Um, and so he, he's not, you know, a big, strong man. He's 116, uh, I said. Uh, it'll come back to me. I have to think. He's an old fart. So that's important to keep in mind. But it is, ex- it is significant here that God said Isaac was Abraham's only son. What about Ishmael? Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn son through Hagar, but Isaac was the only son of promise. You know, we can go out and we can make mistakes, but we can't then claim that the result of that mistake is God's blessing. You created a mistake, but that doesn't replace God's purpose for your life. And so, Ishmael, as we learned last week, God sent Ishmael away 
early on so that he would not be there as a, uh, a if you will, a distraction. If God told him, okay, you have to uh, kill one of your sons, but you still have another one, you know, it's, no, it sounds horrible to say so, but it's a little easier on him because the promise that God gave him, well, it could be fulfilled through Ishmael if that were the case. God had to remove Ishmael, and he refers now to Isaac as Abraham's only son. That is pretty important stuff right there. You see, God was commanding the old patriarch to sacrifice his only son of promise, the son in whom rests all of Abraham's hopes and dreams and the fulfillment of God's promises. God's command must not have made any sense to poor Abraham. And there was no earthly way in Abraham's mind to balance this command with God's precious promise regarding his son of promise. This is a, an important verse in which we use our old friend, the rule of first mention. This rule of interpretation says the first time a word, phrase, place, or event is mentioned in God's holy word kind of holds the key to understanding it later on in God's holy word. So this is the first time the words love and only son occur in God's holy word together. The Hebrew word for love is first found here in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2. The Hebrew word for love. Abraham's love for his only son, whom God asked him to sacrifice, is a picture of a later event that Christ Jesus described in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the ultimate test of Abraham's faith. But it is pointing to the ultimate test of Christ Jesus' faith as well. Could Abraham, in faith, give up the child of his old age, his only son of promise? God commanded Abraham to make the sacrifice on one of the mountains in the land of Moriah. By the way, do you remember in which city Solomon built the temple? According to 2 Chronicles chapter uh, 3 and verse 1. Well, I'm going to tell you. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jehusite. Jews believe that the altar of burnt offerings... Um, in the temple stood on the very site of the altar on which Abraham offered Isaac. Whether true or not, we will not know for certain until we see Christ Jesus in heaven. But it, it does kind of make you wonder, doesn't it? That's pretty neat stuff right there. Um, the, cross, or the, the altar of Abraham and the altar of burnt offerings today. Now, what I find most incredible is how Abraham was immediately obedient, leaving early the very next morning with two of his young men and Isaac. Abraham traveled from Beersheba, about 60 miles north, to Mount Moriah. Abraham was determined to be obedient, despite the fact that this seemed to be the end of God's purpose for his life. God has based you know, Abraham's whole promise on this son. And now God has told him to sacrifice that son in obedience to God. He's losing not just his son, he's losing his promise. This is a, a pretty heavy blow to Abraham. Can he do it? Of course, we already know the story, but still, could you do it? Could you sacrifice that which you love the most on this earth for God if he commanded you to? Just a question. You don't have to get mad at me. But anyway, um, <clears throat> Abraham said to his two young servants, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. That's a statement of faith as in itself right there. And I love that statement. We're going to come right back to you. Just hang on here. I like that. Now, of course, had he told him, I'm going to go kill my son. I'll be back in, in a day. You know, they... There would have been a fight of some sort, I'm sure. You know, um, so nonetheless, it's a statement of faith. But this is the first time that the word worship is found in God's holy word. 
Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac was the greatest act of worship recorded anywhere within the pages of God's holy word. If we truly worship, we are willing to put our most valued possessions, our everything, if you will, on the altar of sacrifice. According to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2, what kind of sacrifice does God expect from us today? Well, I'll read it to you. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. I love this next word because Christians hate hearing it. It says that present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. Oh, we don't have to be holy. That's just silly talk. We can sin because we're saved. Really? Because that's not what God's holy word declares. You can keep sinning if you want, but you're sinning yourself into punishment. And it is an idiotic choice to do. Idiotic. God commands us to be holy. Not to earn your salvation because you are saved. And for anyone to sit there and tell you that God's holy word never commands us to live a holy life, they are liars. And again, who is the father of lies? That's right, Satan himself. So don't listen to anyone who can't even know how to read their Bible. It's in black and white right there. Holy, acceptable unto God, which kind of goes along with holy. Because, you know, a sinful life isn't acceptable to a holy God. And then he says, which is your reasonable service. Not unreasonable. It's reasonable to to try to live um, for the God who died for you. That's certainly reasonable. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is that good? So the will of God is good, it's acceptable, and perfect. And yet we don't want to live that because we have too much fun in our own stuff. Wouldn't you rather live in something that's good and perfect and acceptable is always good? I think we should desire to live according to God's command, period. Don't use some excuse, well, I'm just human. And, you know, humans aren't perfect. That's just a lazy excuse to not even try to to do what God commands us to do. Lazy and hateful towards the God who commands it. For all of us with children, we know how it is when your child turns around and and flat out refuses to do what you tell them to do. And that's what we are doing to God every time we refuse to do what he has commanded. Your living sacrifice is to live holy and acceptable unto God. It's not that difficult. It might be tough at times, but it's not impossible. The problem is that we don't have enough faith to even try it. That's sad right there. Our forefathers that went before us in the name of Christ Jesus gave their lives for the name of Christ and for living a holy life. And yet we spit in their faces as we just claim, well, I'm just a human. What a sad state of affairs modern Christianity has Uh, sunk deep into horrible horrible a disgrace to the name of christ jesus and that none of this stuff is, is scripted in any way it just it bothers me to the core of my being to see what people who call themselves christian on sunday morning um do the rest of the time and depending on the church you go to If you go to a rock and roll concert church, they're not going to really teach you anything about living a holy life. They teach you about if it feels good, it's good. The music, the reason for the rock and roll concert is because it feels good to the body. And when it feels good to the body, it's got to be good. Well, you could say the same thing about sex and drugs. Does that make it good? No. But those churches rely upon that feel-good feeling because they're not teaching anything good. Meanwhile, back at the Bible Ranch, I should get back to the lesson in, in, before us. The Greek word translated here, by the way, as service, the reasonable service, means divine service, or if you will, worship. Again, some churches refer to uh, their music leaders, by the way, as worship leaders. 
or a worship pastor. There's a big danger in that because some folks might think that the music is the worship, but music only helps prepare for the message um, and worship. Music is not the worship. And if you're relying on music to worship, then you're worshiping yourself or you're worshiping music. To worship God, you don't need you know, rock and roll music, period. All you need is a worshipful heart because that's where worship comes from. <clears throat> True worship is giving our all to God like Abraham did on Mount Moriah. Neither the music nor the message can do anything but help guide us to a place of worship at best. Abraham put the wood for the burnt offering on his son Isaac. Now, it should be pointed out um, that the wood for the sacrifice was probably carried on Isaac's back. You know, carrying it all the way up like this is going to be pretty tiring, and it's not going to be easy to do. So even back then they knew to put it on the back. So Isaac is carrying the wood for his burnt sacrifice up the mountain on his back. Now, I, I kind of like that right there. Uh, and I'm going to refer back and forth um, probably several times throughout this message. But this is truly a prophetic image of a later event recorded in John chapter 19 and verse 17. And it says, And Jesus, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Isaac carried his wood on his back to his sacrifice, forecasting Christ Jesus carrying the cross of Calvary up his back, on his back up the mountain for his sacrifice. <laughs> Friends, I love this story. It's not just amazing faith, but it's amazing grace through and through. The story of Abraham and Isaac points us towards the story of Christ Jesus and Calvary. But then Abraham took some fire, um, perhaps uh, a burning stick, since he had no matches. He didn't have his little Bic ladder. He could flip it out, you know, a Zippo. He also took a knife in his hand, and then the two of them hiked up this mountainside together. And as they walked up the mountain, Isaac innocently asked his father, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? With no hint of bitterness or doubt, Abraham responded, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Now, a lot of people like to place the emphasis on himself. So if I say that Brother Priest himself is going to um, donate something, does that mean that he's going to kill himself for it? No, it means that he's going to be the one donating. The verse simply states that God will, he himself will provide a sacrifice for this burnt offering. The, this is important because if people are saying, well, see, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus didn't have a burnt offering. Get your facts straight. He simply is stating God will provide a lamb. It's coming from God himself. Not that God is the lamb in this case, but only that God is providing it. Now, this is still, even if you try uh, to, if, even if you remove that twist that people like to add in there, is this still not a great story? Does it need extra stuff added into it? Of course it doesn't. It needs only the truth, the holy word of God. This was the greatest demonstration of faith anywhere in the Old Covenant because Abraham knew God's promise to him was all wrapped up in Isaac alone. There is no way Abraham could have possibly reconciled all of this in his mind, but yet he obeyed anyway. Abraham obeyed God even when it did not seem to make much sense at all. How could Abraham been, uh, have been so willing to sacrifice Isaac? Well, let's look at what Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19 says to answer this question. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. This is pretty important stuff. But here's the key. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. You know, 
he may not have understood everything. He knew that everything was, for him was bound up in his son on that altar. And yet he trusted God. He believed that God had the power to raise his son from the dead. This has never happened before anywhere in the Old Covenant. This would be the first time of a story like this happening. So who told him this? Well, it wasn't me. Brother Priest might have shared it with him when he was teaching uh, Abraham as a little kid in Sunday school. I don't know. Um, But how did he believe in this resurrection that had never been taught or mentioned? This is faith in action. An amazing amount of faith. That's why I called it supernatural. We have to be told stuff. And we have to be told stuff time and time again before we start listening to it. Who told Abraham? No one. There's no documentation of that. What an amazing amount of faith. But anyway, so when life does not seem to make much sense, we need to go where God guides, whether it's a Mount Moriah or whatever. But we must also trust God to provide. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 9 through 14, And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called on him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, Here am I. And the angel said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now, I have previously mentioned this before, but when we talk about faith and faithfulness regarding this Bible story specifically, I think that sometimes we do not give due credit where it is uh, rightly deserved. You see, what amazes me most in this Bible story is not the faith and faithfulness of Abraham, which is supernatural all by itself, but of Isaac. Yes, Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son of promise in obedience to the God who personally promised his only son of promise, but it was Isaac who had the most to lose here. And as far as we can tell from this Bible story, he willingly allowed himself to be sacrificed in obedience to God. Friends, I have searched the scriptures through and through, and I cannot find anywhere within the pages of God's holy word not even one single mention of Isaac resisting his father Abraham. Surely a young man of Isaac's age could uh, could have easily overpowered a 100-plus-year-old man. But yet there is absolutely no mention of any such resistance. Oh, my. Oh, my soul, I just cannot imagine he's willing to die. He's willing to just allow someone to kill him. Who would do a thing like that? It's not like he's doing it to protect his dad necessarily, as you know, some invaders are invading in the house and he's going to die fighting. He's willingly laying down his life as a sacrifice out of obedience to God. Friends, that is an amazing amount of faith and faithfulness right there. And if you are not yet aware, there is only one other similar mention of any person anywhere in God's holy word with faith and faithfulness of such magnitude. And that is, of course, Christ Jesus himself, who willingly left his throne in heaven to come down to earth and live a sinner's life, dying a sinner's death on the cruel cross of Calvary. And he didn't die for himself. He died for you and me. Isaac, Christ, Jesus, they're not the same person. But if you don't see how Isaac points towards Christ Jesus, you're missing a lot. But what about you? 
in comparison, do you really have true faith in God? Do you really demonstrate the faithfulness, true faithfulness toward God the way Abraham and Isaac did? After building the altar and binding Isaac to it, Abraham stood over Isaac with his knife raised to sacrifice his only son of promise. And at that time, the angel of God then called out to him by name and said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. From God's perspective, Abraham had already offered his son because um, God saw Abraham's heart. If you remember 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God saw Abraham's heart and knew that he was willing to do what God had commanded, even when it must have seemed impossible. And then after God's intervention, Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. Now I have to ask, if that ram had already been there all along, how could both Abraham and Isaac possibly have not seen it? I mean, we know again about Isaac, he had a pretty great personal interest in a, a sacrificial ram. Because if there was a ram there, he wouldn't have had to die. Just like having to send Ishmael away first, the ram could not have been there until after he had proven his faith. There were, with the ram, there was no reasonable reason for Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. But yet, in God's perfect timing, at that exact moment that they needed that ram, God provided a sacrifice. Just as Abraham had pro uh, um, promised, God himself did provide a ram for sacrifice. Friends, there's a song, I'm not going to try to sing it because I don't know how it goes very well, but it, it says over and over and again and again, God is faithful. I love that song because it's true. God is always faithful. Abraham took that ram that God had provided and offered it as a burnt sacrifice instead of Isaac. In this chapter of Abraham's life, Abraham saw something no person would ever see or understand again until the life of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus even told us uh, about it in John chapter 8 and verse 16. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Who saw Christ Jesus' day? The one who was imitating it from the start, Abraham. When Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah, or maybe sometime later, he was blessed to see the day of Christ. He could not have possibly fully understood the implications or the details, but Abraham saw Christ's day. Abraham believed that God could raise the dead some 2,500 years before God raised Christ Jesus. The ultimate sacrifice for sin from the dead. That is why Christ Jesus said that Abraham saw his day and was glad, and we should too. After the experience on Moriah, because of God's intervention, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Or if you prefer, Jehovah-Jireh means God will provide. This name for God is future tense, by the way. Showing Abraham was not merely thinking of his own experience, but God will provide for the needs of all of his people through all time. All of us have our own Mount Moriah where we must be willing to give up things that might interfere with you living God's purpose for your life. It might be a person, might be a possession, it might be your passion or a plan or whatever else it might be. But like Abraham, you may not be required to give it up, but you must demonstrate the absolute willingness to give it up completely. God may grant you to keep it as long as it doesn't get in the way of your purpose for his life, or his purpose for your life. When God calls each of us to our own Mount Moriah to make a sacrifice for him, 
He will faithfully provide everything we need. I am here reminded of a wonderful old saying that reads, Wherever God guides, God will provide. Christ Jesus expressed this principle in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It doesn't say, seek ye first the kingdom of gold and your self-righteousness. No, kingdom of God and God's righteousness. You seek those first, and God will take care of you. So whenever life does not seem to make much sense, we must go where God guides, trust God to provide, and in God's promises reside. Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 24, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, Behold, um, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. If he had not obeyed, where would we be today? We have no idea. Everything hinged upon this moment in time, and Abraham stepped to the plate and knocked it out of the ballpark. I tell you what. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, <coughs> she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor. Huz, his firstborn, and Buzz, his brother, and Kemuel, the father of Haram, and Chesed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. <laughs> These eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and his concubine, whose name was Ruma. She bare also Taba, and Gaham, and Tahash, and Hamaka. God rewarded Abraham for his faith and faithfulness in several ways. First, God reminded Abraham of his promise that God will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And then God uh, added that thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. That's a pretty awesome promise right there. But this promise would be fulfilled during the conquest of Canaan. In Joshua's farewell address, just before he died, Joshua told the Israelites in Joshua 23 and verse 14, And behold, this day... I am going the way of all the earth, and ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing that hath, uh, hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. What he's saying? God is always faithful. Abraham was also rewarded by some very special news from the east about his family, from whom he had not heard from in more than 25 years. He learned that his brother Nahor had many children. And even better, though, Abraham learned that the daughter of Nahor's youngest son had a daughter named Rebekah. For those of you who may not remember, Rebekah was to be the wife that God was preparing for Isaac already. Abraham was experiencing God's truth in Psalm 37, 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Even before Abraham had thought about it, God was already preparing it. Wow! And yet we can't even pray in faith. God knows. God sees. God hears everything. And God wants to. Bless you, but you must be faithful first. It's not, well, if you give me this, I'll be faithful after it. No, you earn it now. You want that thing from God? Well, act like you love him and serve him. Excuse me. Friends, life may not always make much sense but in God's promises we absolutely can reside I can tell you from my own personal experience that no life doesn't make sense um, but you are 
Um, maybe you are fighting dark storms of life or maybe you are stumbling through your struggles in your life here below or maybe you simply do not understand God's purpose for your life. Life may not, al- not, may not always seem to make much sense and well, that is fine, but it is what we do when life does not seem to make much sense that is most important. We may find it hard to try to live God's purpose for our life when we are confused or in despair. So that is why it's so critically important for us that we do these three biblical things uh, that Abraham taught us when life does not seem to make much sense. We must go where God guides us, period. It's not where you want to be. It's where God wants you to be. You must trust God to provide. And finally... In God's promises, you must reside. Friends, I ask you this morning, are you living these three biblical things in your life? If not, what will you now do differently to live these three biblical things whenever life does not seem to make much sense? And again, I don't ask anyone to answer. It's something to think about. It's impossible to compare ourselves with Abraham and Isaac, or so we say. But is it? Is the faith that God um, expected from Abraham and Isaac really any different than the faith he expects from us? It's the same. The only difference is the level of commitment that Abraham and Isaac displayed. Their dedication, their faith, and their faithfulness to God. And we have a fulfilled promise. Christ Jesus has already risen from the dead, and yet still we want to sit back and watch the world go by. And when I say go by, they're going down a a fast-moving river to a very steep waterfall that leads into the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. What are you doing to help pull them from that, to save them from the lake of fire? If you have faith, You can do amazing things. Faith and faithfulness of Abraham and Isaac. What an incredible lesson this morning. Life doesn't have to seem fair if you will live these three principles in your life. And of course, whenever life, uh, whether life makes sense or not, it is always a biblical thing to be right back here uh, next and every Sunday morning as we continue our continuing Bible study series. We have two weeks left on the life of Abraham.